The following interview was conducted with Marth Professor Martha Chiskin, Professor Emeritus of Biological Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, January the 22nd, 2008 in Stewart Center on campus. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit about your, where you were born in your early years and parents and siblings. Well, I was born, grew up, went to school uh, all the way through the first year and a half of college in the city of Chicago. And I lived in different places uh, in Chicago, but uh, I, that's where I was born. I got a very good education um, in grade school, in high school, and I went to Wilbur Wright uh, Junior College for a year and a half before I, I went away to school. It was, it was debatable whether I was going to be able to go away to school, and it may sound really strange now, but I got a, a uh, scholarship, a tuition scholarship of a hundred dollars a year, which is what the tuition was at Western Illinois <laughs> University then. And if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have been able to go away to school. Isn't that absolutely incredible in terms of what it costs today? Well, years ago at Purdue, there were no there was no the tuition. The fees were a lot lot That's different right. than they are today, That's right. and people forget about you know are not aware of that. And when I started college at at um, Wright Junior College. Where's that uh, the, in Chicago? Yes, okay. it's it's on the it's on the northwest side of Chicago, and the junior college system in Chicago was really excellent, and it, the tuition was ten dollars a semester <laughs> to go to school, and I had some wonderful teachers during that period period of time, and uh, you know I I grew up as a sort of a um, a tomboyish kind of person. I was interested in in um, uh, athletic things per se, but at that point in time, girls really were not allowed or encouraged to do, um, you know, team sports. But, uh, you know, I was, uh, I swam and, uh, and I was uh, a good runner. If I, if I got in trouble, I could either beat them up or outrun them, one of the two. Or some of both, right? <laughs> or some of both, right? <laughs> and, and I always enjoyed um, science. I was encouraged by my parents, neither of whom ever finished college. My mother never went. My father uh, went a little bit. And, but nevertheless, they encouraged their three children. Uh, I always remember that you're going on to college. I'm the only one who finished of the three of us. And, but Did you have brothers and sisters. I have a I have a younger brother. Actually, there there are three individual families. My sister, who is eight years older than I, and my brother, who's nine years younger. So I always call myself the middle neglected child, <laughs> 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 which of course was not true. And um, uh, but ne but nevertheless, we were three individual families raised in three different. Uh, decades, which means we had totally different experiences from one another. Right. And, and I'm the only one who went on to finish college and, and uh, get a PhD. How did you happen to select this school in Illinois? <laughs> uh, you mean Western Illinois? Yes. Um, well, I had to go to a state school, um, and girls were encouraged to do one of a few things. One of them is to be a teacher. Well, Western Illinois University was a teaching uh, institution, and so I was going to be a science teacher of some sort. And I was vacillating between chemistry and uh, biology, and I decided, well, maybe there might be a woman or two more in biology, so I chose biology, but I was wrong. I was the only woman in all my classes. <laughs> going through through college, whether it was chemistry, physics, or, or biology. There just were not very many women who, who did was, that. What was campus like? And, and uh, you, live, you lived on campus then? Uh, well, I lived, I lived in, a, a, um, uh, in the upstairs. Well, first of all, I lived in a little apartment in, that I shared with uh, several other girls. And then I joined a sorority very loosely joined a sorority because anything resembling what is a sorority today here on this campus is totally not at all to be believed. But anyway, we, uh, we lived in the upstairs of some woman's home 
and uh, we cooked our meals down in the basement, and that was our sorority. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and that's and that's where I live. We even shared beds and you know things that young people that wouldn't, it wouldn't dream of doing yeah. today because it just wasn't so. I mean, there were families were big and 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 brothers and sisters often slept in the same beds in sure. those days, and so the sorority sisters did as well. <laughs> but, and, uh, and so you majored in biology. I you? majored in biology. Okay. And I I graduated. Um, when did you? What year did you graduate? I graduated in 1956, and uh, um, I I had a minor in chemistry, and when I graduated, I applied for jobs. Believe it or not, in Alaska, and I went up to Alaska and, and applied for a job at the high school in um, Anchorage, Alaska, and they hired me. And I also applied for a native service job. Thank goodness I didn't find, they didn't find me soon enough because I'm not sure I was quite cut out for being up above the Arctic Circle uh, and, and in a little village <laughs> teaching and being, you know, chief cook and bottle washer and postmaster <laughs> and, as, and everything else. But anyway, I taught at a very large high school. We had about 1,700 students, which was more than was in my university when I went to it. There were only 1,500 students uh -huh. when I went to what it. What was it like up there? How did you happen to pick Alaska? Oh, I don't know. You wanted to go way up there. Just wanted to do something different. Sure. Um, and so I, so I taught um, uh, biology and I taught chemistry. And uh, I, st I lived there for three years. I voted for statehood. So you're looking at one of the few people still left <laughs> who, voted, who <laughs> voted for statehood for some state, yes. I hope that appears on your resume, but we don't, don't lose sight of it. Don't lose, and I still have the newspapers somewhere in some box, you know, of all the statehood uh, things that happened. Sure. And then I came back to, to um, Chicago, and I taught in a suburb of Chicago. In a high school? or In high school, yes. Yes, I was a high school teacher. Uh -huh. and. And I taught at Maine West, uh, which was one of the main township schools. And they required a, a master's degree and so uh, within five years. And so I applied for an NSF Summer Institute program. And I applied all over the country thinking that, that you know, the process would winnow down my choices. Well, it didn't. I was accepted at every place I applied. And so I had to make a choice. And I was thinking about going to Arizona. And I was thinking about going to Purdue. And then there were some others that were not quite as interesting. And I thought, four summers going to Arizona, maybe not. Um, Purdue, I knew nothing about. I thought it was a men's school, <laughs> primarily. Even and, though it was the next date over. <laughs> yes, well, I, was, I didn't even know it was a public institution, actually because most people think Have of Purdue state. that it's like an Ivy League institution. And, um, and since it was reasonably close to Chicago, but not too close, and so I thought that was probably a good choice for going four years, summers in a row. So I came down here, went to the Summer Institute program, and at the end of that summer, the head of the biology department called me in, and it happened to be Henry Koffler. He would be another one interesting one to interview when he's here for some meeting. And Is he, uh, does he uh, live in Arizona? Yes, he lives in, in, uh, in um, um, let's see, he, he started a, a retirement community in Arizona. But anyway, um, so he called me in and in his usual fashion, you don't always know what Henry was really saying. You know, you would say, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And when you'd leave, you'd say, what did he really say? And he offered me a job, and I left, and I went to my um, entomology professor, and I said, what do you think he was really offering me? And he said, oh, he was probably offering you a grad TA position. And I said, oh, well, I can't, I couldn't afford to do that, because I, I have a townhouse up in, in one of the suburbs of Chicago that I have to pay for, you know, and I have bills, and." And so I went back to teach high school at Maine West, 
And in the spring of the, of the next year, I got a call from um, Joe Novak, who was a professor in biology, and he said, uh, are you coming this next year? And I said, uh, well, nobody ever really told me what the offer was. And so then he told me, and he told me the salary, and I said, oh, well, that's not a TA. They were offering me a full-time tenure track, um, which doesn't exist anymore here at Purdue. Um, uh, uh, not a, it wasn't a, a lecturer. Instructor? It was an instructor, yes. It was a full-time um, tenure track instructor position in biology. And they told me the salary it was more than I was making. And I said, why not? <laughs> you know, I was adventuresome. Why not? If I went to Alaska. That's, <laughs> right. that's right. There you go. So, and, and that was probably the most momentous decision that, that I can recall making was the choice between Arizona and Purdue, first of all. And then the decision to just pick up and come to Purdue to be an instructor in who knows what. I didn't even know what I was going to be teaching. And I found out much later that Henry Koffler was actually recruiting what he thought were talented uh, high school teachers who were in the NSF program. Probably not the right legal thing to do. But anyway, he was looking for people. That, as a source, probably. Right, sure. as a source of teachers for undergraduates in the biology department. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was assigned to the um, uh, introductory principles of biology course mm -hmm. in biology. And the professor happened to be Al Chiskin. And so Al and I worked together for several years. And we always worked well together, and uh, I learned a great deal from him. He was an incredible mentor and uh, uh, role model about how one should treat students, how one can reach students in different ways in, in teaching, and, and in general, you know, how the whole teaching issue between teacher, mentor, whatever you happen to be, and student actually can, can be. be developed. And, uh, you know, during this period of time, there was never any uh, social interaction that occurred between us. And in fact, I always wondered why he never took me home for dinner. He took everybody else home for dinner, but he never took me home to meet his mother. <laughs> and in later years, he said, well, why should I take you home to meet my mother, you're the one I was going to marry. <laughs> I but said, yes, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> we didn't discuss that. <laughs> we didn't discuss that. <laughs> so it wasn't until he went away on sabbatical to Washington, D.C. at the, terrest at the uh, Carnegie Institute of Terrestrial Magnetism that we actually both decided we missed one another for more than just collegial reasons. Sure, as a colleague. colleague yeah, huh? right. And so I went out to visit him and we went up to Baja Bamain, ate lobster. We went out to Mount Desert, which is a wonderful state park. And he asked me to marry him. <laughs> and we had never dated. <laughs> we had never gone out. And uh, so it was an interesting situation. And I said, well, we have to talk to Henry to see whether he'll allow us to both to continue, because we worried about the nepotism issue. And Henry gave his blessing. And so indeed, we did marry the the, the following May, Very and good. invited all of our colleagues. We got married just across the street from here the in, in Church? what used to be the Presbyterian Church, not the big one, the oh. chapel that was next door, and uh, had 300 out of our most intimate friends and students. <laughs> <laughs> let me back, let me back. Uh, what about the mass, uh, just uh, backtracking a little bit. Did you finish that master's? Uh, no, I never finished a oh. master's. Because um, you were here for what, what two summers? No, I was. I came. For, yes, no. I came the first summer. I was offered the job. I came back the second summer. That was in the summer of '63. Okay. And I came back in the summer of '64, knowing that I was going to come back permanently in that. Because you had that offer. In that fall, yes. Okay. And so, uh, no, I'd never finished that master's, but I decided as long as I was here at Purdue. And I now knew, I thought, what a PhD was, because I hadn't a clue. 
uh, at that point what a PhD was. Then I decided I would would start working on a PhD. And in the biology department, it is not a requirement to get a master's on the way to your PhD. And so I worked full time, taught for six years, um, and then I I applied for an NSF pre-doctoral fellowship my last year to do my final research push. So it took me seven years to finish that PhD. And during that time, you know, my family kept telling their friends, well, our daughter is working on her PhD, you know. And pretty soon they were all saying, mm-hmm, sure, mm-hmm, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so it was it's quite a process. It was quite an event when indeed it happened. And, and uh, When did you finally finish then? I finished in 71. Okay, and you had a lot of big celebration then, right? We had a lot of big celebration, right. And see, I had been out of school a long time from 56 until I came back to Purdue sure. in 63. And, and that was the first time I'd taken um, any real courses. I'd taken some courses to get certified to teach sure. physics because right. I taught biology, chemistry, and physics, all three of those in yeah. high school. But uh, it had been a long time since I'd been in school and I wasn't sure you know, you have to get reacclimated and get reacclimated and and all of all of that sort of thing. And um, so when I got my PhD, th then then I applied for an NSF uh, postdoc. And it isn't common that you're allowed to sort of stay where you got your your PhD. But um, NSF did allow me to do that, and I. I finished the first year, and at the end of that year, Henry stepped into the picture again, and he offered me an assistant professor's job. Uh, and so I didn't go on and, and do the second year of my of mm -hmm. my postdoc. Okay. So that's how it all began, and uh, how you got to Purdue, and how I got to Purdue, which sort of emphasizes the fact that if you go through life with blinders on and don't and don't take advantage of opportunities that sort of pop up in places that you don't necessarily expect them to pop up, then you might miss out. I mean, I'd, I just don't know. I'm sure I would have been happy. I was happy in everything that I had done in my professional career. Uh, I mean, I was happy in high school. I enjoyed the high school students. And I probably could have been happy the rest of my life doing those things, and who knows where that would have led. I don't know where that would have led. Right. But I, I feel strongly that I probably would not have done as many things as I ended up doing without having a, a, a mentor and a helpmate and a, 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 and a loving support. person who sort of was always, you know, yes, you should do that, Martha. <laughs> why don't you? Why don't you? Why don't you do that? Move on, so, right, yeah. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about uh, that women in science discipline. That was kind of a, an unusual thing, and you got very, very unusual. That. Right. Um, the, that was a, br a breakthrough for that. Well, Purdue was the the first uh, institution of higher education that offered a women in science course in the School of Science. There had there had been a few of them offered in liberal arts and in women's studies and so forth, but nobody in any school of science or college of science was willing to admit that there was an issue that needed to be worked on. And uh, so the, the, the school of science uh, during the tenure of Felix Haas, well, he was the dean then, and he encouraged the writing of a uh, of, of a grant to FIPSI, which is the, the NSF program for post-secondary education. And so this grant then was the one that funded the Women in Science program in, in 74 and 75. Right, that's what, yeah, I had 74. <clears throat> and uh, it was with Lynn Harrington Brown, who went on to get her PhD in psychology uh, after she left Purdue. And the, the two of us really had an incredibly fantastic um, experience because the, the, the course was unique in that the young women were freshmen, 
there may have been a sophomore or two, but primarily you freshmen. Limit, you wanted freshmen primarily. Right. Okay. Primarily freshmen women, and uh, they would they would have um, an opportunity to meet women who were in their early, mid, and late career stages, who we invited to come in pairs uh, throughout the semester. And they were here for two days in a very intensive kind of way in which, in which um, uh, they, they met with the students, they had dinner with the students, they gave a presentation to the students, and that the following morning, and they had an opportunity to come to our house and, and just sit around and talk with them on a- With in, the students. In a, in, right, and the students with a, in a casual way. And the next morning, I interviewed them, and all of those videotapes still exist. And some of those women in, who were younger uh, have gone on to be quite famous uh, uh, in their mid and late careers. And um, those, those formed the basis of being able to go to other institutions and to show them what it is that we were doing here. And, and the young women also had an opportunity to work in a laboratory so that they got uh, mentoring in a different kind of way. And the, the, the ex whole experience was a very positive one for not only us, we learned a lot, but sure. also for the young women and many of them went on to, to reach higher than they had thought about reaching. And, and one, of the, one of the things that, that my being uh, a professor in an introductory biology course did was that for almost all of my female students, I was the only female professor that they had in their career as they went through science. In other words, they did not see any other women doing what they were now saying, I want to be one of those, but I don't see any. And they saw us, they saw that I was married, they saw that I wasn't really too weird, <laughs> you know, I, I, I wasn't uh, the stereotypic view of what a woman scientist uh, might have been depicted as in in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. and not only that, but but we adopted two children, and we had students to our home um, on a regular basis for for a number of years. We would have what we called student faculty staff community parties, in which we would invite students from our two respective courses. By this time, I had taken Al's course away from him, and he had to start a new one, <laughs> which was very su su successful. Yeah. But we would have parties which would have 70 to 100 people of students, faculty, and then people from the community who were doing what our students said they wanted to do. So they would have, Interact. in a social environment, able to, to meet and talk with, with those, those kinds of folks. But we did that all during that early period when the, when the children were young. And so my women students who had come in as freshmen, maybe aiming here, said, hmm, maybe I can aim here <laughs> because I see somebody doing what I think I want to do and, it, and it's an okay and thing to do. And it's doable. Right. You know, you don't have to be a total uh, superwoman or wonder woman who was one of my heroines when I was growing up. Uh, too bad I didn't keep those comic books, I'll tell you. <laughs> they would be worth a great deal today. I hear you. <laughs> oh. So anyway, that course then, uh, I went out um, both in, in, our, in the state and nationally and internationally and made presentations on uh, on that course, and many other kinds of courses like that were begun across the country. But when the NSF grant ended, we went to my department head and to the dean and said, you know, th this, is, this really took a great deal out of both of us. You know, this was on top of everything else that we did. We sure. didn't have any release time to do any of these things, and it was it was really incredible. 
uh, the amount of effort that it took, and we didn't mind doing that, but we can't do this forever because it's just overwhelming. And the response was, well, gee, your results are wonderful. The young women are going on. They're being kept. Their attrition rate in, in, in science now is basically equivalent to that of men, whereas it had been much higher uh, in, the, in, in the group that didn't have this kind of attention. And they said, um, we don't have the money to fund it like you were funded before and um, you'd still have to do what you were doing before. We said, mm, you know, that's not really doable. And so from the mid-70s until the mid-90s, then that concept basically lay dormant. And in the mid-90s, again, um, because of, of um, the Sloan Foundation, then the School of Science and the, the Schools of Engineering, they were called schools then. <laughs> You'll have to forgive my not, not putting the colleges in there. Um, joined together with a grant for undergraduate and graduate women of a mentoring program and um, um, a residential program in the residence halls. And at that time, I, I hired um, a young woman, her name is Barbara Clark, to be a quarter-time um, sort of director of this new Sloan program for women. Well, it has now grown into a very successful and um, self-supporting uh, women in science and diversity program, which is funded by the School of Science, and Harry Morrison was the dean during those times, and, and he put money into an endowment so that there would always be some money to support this, For this program. This program. Mm -hmm. And so it lives, and uh, Barb Clark has gone on to do really wonderful things with that program and with the diversity issues at large, and, mm -hmm. and it's become a very um, important program for for women and for uh, persons of color. Sure. And so I'm really proud that, that all of those things ultimately came, have, came to fruition. Yeah, they, they sort of come around in a circle, and, and eventually the, the right time does, does come right, for that yeah. to happen. You're talking about students. Your whole, whole life has been focused on that. And That's right. My whole life has right. been focused on, on students. And, and even when I, when I moved into the dean's office in the, in the School of Science, my focus was uh, undergraduate issues, from counseling to educational policy to you know anything that that involved the undergraduate student was in Martha's bailiwick, and and as a result, uh, I I think a lot of positive things occurred. I mean, I was the first woman uh, uh, dean to be in the meetings with the men, all the other administrators, they didn't quite know what to do with me. Not only was I the first woman, but I was the first woman who kept talking about teaching. And, you know, they would have these discussions, and I would always bring up this issue, well, what about the, the teaching piece of this? And they'd sort of look at me strangely. And after a while, they began to take on that mantra and appreciate how important undergraduate education was. I mean, you know, they would complain about, well, we don't have any good U.S. graduate students. And I kept saying, where do U.S. graduate students come? They come from talented undergraduates that you have mentored and that you have introduced to, to research <clears throat> and scholarly endeavors. And if you nurture those, you're going to get them up here in the graduate school. You know, and they'd look at me sort of blankly and say, huh? <laughs> and and so it was an interesting, it was an interesting experience. I mean, all through my entire career, I had interesting women experiences of, in various places of discrimination, in various places of harassment, in various places of success. And, you know, I sort of learned to, to roll with the punches and not get too upset um, when, when things and occurred. And when my colleagues would, would look at me strangely when we were changing our language to include women 
in the in our language and where we would we would use we would use describers that were not male or female you know they'd say well that means women too and i said no it doesn't <laughs> and they'd <laughs> look at me strangely <laughs> oh. <laughs> so so i was sort of a quiet feminist i never was a radical feminist uh in in the true sense of the word but i was always a quiet uh, encourager of people reaching their potential, whether they were men or women, whether they were of color or not. To and, bringing them along. And bringing them along and tried to teach my students that if, if someone has given you a hand reached back and given you a hand up, that it is your responsibility that when you reach this point that you don't think you're holier than thou, that you too reach back and you help those who need to be brought up the ladder as well. And I'm so proud of some of my students who have over the years come back and told me how important those lessons were. And this, is what, this is what they were doing, you know, to, to give back in, in the same way that they were given to. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's what teaching is all about, and, and that's the whole idea, coming back to staying in the same place. You find out about these things when you spend, your, when you spend 34 or 36 right. years of your life right. you know, in, in the same place, right. not including my retirement years, of course. The yeah. philosophy of teaching, you, you really are you're mentored and you really are very involved, we're very involved with, in it. And, and I, I mean, I learned these things from Al. I mean, it, the, 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 these, these ideas um, uh, came essentially from the way I saw him treat students and how important that was. And that, that not every student learns in the same way, and therefore when you teach, you have to have more bags of tricks than one. And if, if this student can't understand something this way, then you have to try it that way, or maybe one of your TAs or another undergraduate can try a way which gets through to, to, reach that, him. to right. that person. Right. Yeah. And we also had the philosophy that, that it would be very nice if you learned what you should have learned by the time of the exam, but if for some reason you didn't, but then you later do and you can prove it to me, then you can come back and demonstrate that and and I will take that as you having learned which is what I really wanted you to do in the first right. place. That's a very good point. Um, the universities, uh, you were talking about the student of science, you were assistant dean, tell us a little bit about some of the things that were involved when you were in that office there. Well I had a very big role in in science counseling when I first began and in fact I was the director of science counseling in the dean's office in the dean's office when I was first brought in that that was one of my major responsibilities and um, uh, taking care of like day on campus dealing with parents uh, um, and taking care of of student transfer issues and you know all of that kind of thing was a major part of of my job and then when Harry Morrison came on as dean then he said, I would like you to, to move away from that and to move more freely into the total administration of, of uh, science. And at that point, um, I gave up the science counseling as being its director and somebody else stepped into that position and I became a full-fledged part of the, the dean's uh, inner circle, yes, <clears throat> and, and then took on uh, many of the activities that were related to educational policy uh, and, and any other issue that was, was uh, related to students. And I, and I met students from all over the, the science and non-science community as they wanted to move in and out of, of science, and I chaired numerous committees related to uh, educational policy um, primarily, and and was part of the the uh, faculty council and and all of those things, and so that that my 
exposure to the administration became a much broader one. Mm -hmm. And I was involved in the last um, uh, uh, effort to, to um, that, is not, that is now going on through the, um, oh, well, I've lost the, what it is, where, uh, our accreditation. Oh, the yes. I went through the. I was a, a, North a key component in in the um, um, ten year accreditation process that went on just before I retired. Uh -huh. And they're doing that. They're getting ready to do that now. Yeah, comes <laughs> I'm glad, around, doesn't I'm it? Glad I'm not doing it again. <laughs> right. Uh, well, um, you were served on quite a few. Let's talk about university service your committees. One of the ones that uh, Educational Policy Committee and mm -hmm. some of the others, and I do want you to address you know, in the Athletics Affairs Committee because you right. and Dr. Nelson served on that. Right. The well, the Athletic Affairs, the, the Athletic Affairs Committee is was a, a very long-term um, commitment that I became involved in almost as serendipitously as many other pieces of my life. I mean, it was an opportunity that arose, and I said yes. And at, at the time that I did this, which was in the late 70s, um, I was called on the phone by the then president of the university asking if, if uh, uh, which I think was Art Hansen at that time, and I was asked if I would uh, complete the, the term of a member on the Athletic Affairs Committee who had just passed away. And she was the first woman who had been um, assigned to as that. As a faculty representative? Yeah, as, well, no, she was not the oh. faculty uh, representative. No, that was, hmm. a, that was a man. Okay. Uh, she was a member of, of just a seven-member committee. There was only seven members on that committee. And they were all men. And she was the first woman who had been appointed to that. And this was all during the time of Title IX, right. you know, and, and the university's trying to figure out what is it that we're supposed to be doing and what are we willing to do, what can we afford, you know, and all of those sorts of things. And so I said yes. And during that, those early years was the time when the Big Ten, the NCAA, the AIAW, which was the women's equivalent of the NCAA, were all trying to figure out how were they going to integrate women into um, these organizations, the NCAA and the Big Ten, because until then, women had not been a part of the Big Ten. They, they maybe talked about um, Big Ten things, and the Big Ten might have, have, have had some coordination uh, activity with some of their tournaments, but other than that, I mean, the women were not in. There was not involvement. They were not in the Big Ten. They just were not there, and they were not in the NCAA, and they were in the AIAW, and so the AIAW, of course, was worried. Oh my goodness, here we are, women. We know how to handle all of this. Do we want to go in the NCAA? They will kill us, and and the Big Ten representatives, all men. Uh, except for one woman from Michigan State, uh, said, um, oh gosh, we don't want to bring women in. They're going to spoil our football and basketball. And so I was, uh, I was put, as the only woman on the Athletic Affairs Committee, I was then put on this task force of 20. And there were two of us from each of the 10. There were only 10 then, right. in the Big Ten. Um, and one was a woman and one was a man. And the man was the faculty athletic representative, <coughs> and then there was me. And here I was, this neophyte person. I wasn't an athlete. I mean, I swam. Um, I, the I, committee. I, I earned, a, I earned a, a silver medal in synchronized swimming when I was in college. Whoopee. <laughs> you know, but I, was, you know, I wasn't a jock. I was a scientist and a teacher. And so here I am on this committee of 20, and our assignment was essentially to write the guidelines for how to bring women's sports into the Big Ten, and then how to adjust the governance in the Big Ten 
to represent them. <coughs> so in other words, the, the, uh, the athletic directors in all the schools were men. But there were two of our schools that had, that had a split men's and women's program, and they had their own athletic directors. So here you had Iowa and Minnesota, each of which had a women's program and a men's program, and they were different from the other eight of us. So trying to figure out how do you, how do you okay. let everybody have a proper voice? And there, there, were, there were two committees. There, there was the, uh, well, there were three committees at that time. There was the Faculty Representatives Committee at the Big Ten. There, there was the, um, uh, the Athletic Directors. And then there was the joint group of these two. Well, no women, you know, anywhere to be seen in those. And so we were, designed, we were told to, to come up with the guidelines for how to change the structure so that we give women administrators in athletics as well as women's coaches and the, the women's athletes themselves and the faculty athletic representatives, you have to have, you know, voices. And of course, the men said, well, can't we speak for the both of you? And of course, the women say, no. <laughs> You've got to have some women there because they've had a different culturization, they've had different experiences, and they are likely to have different ultimate goals that they want to reach, and therefore you have to have those diverse voices. It's sort of like talking about race relations but not having anybody of color on the committee. I mean, that was, you know, the same, same thing. Same scenario. And, and so, um, so this task force did accomplish this and we came up with the guidelines for how to do all of this and a timeline for doing it, how many sports there needed to be in order to participate, that you had to have so many women's sports and they had to be at a certain level of support at their institution and, ha and coaching levels and, you know, availability of doctors and, and sports medicine and, you know, all the rest of the stuff that goes the along. The whole operation. The whole operation, right. And so by, by um, 1981, there were enough of the 10 schools who had met those requirements that the women were formally brought into the Big Ten. And we've just passed 25 years right. what of did, women what about in the Big that, Ten. Uh, AIU, did that AIAW. Well, yeah. the AIAW um, basically... I mean, there, was, there were a number of years of serious battles, and some things had to happen during that time, whether it was at the AIAW, the NCAA, or at the conference level of the Big Ten and the other various conferences. And basically what had to happen is that the old athletic directors had to retire and the new, younger athletic directors, who were still mostly men, but who had grown up in an in environment in which they shared uh, responsibilities with their female counterparts, and therefore they were not so threatened by the women coming in to their sport. Sure. And so we, I mean, the Big Ten went through its, its period of time when the men walked out and said they wouldn't come back to the joint group until those women administrators who weren't athletic directors were gone. <laughs> You know, all of these kinds of tantrums that, that occurred, and they occurred at, I'm sure that they occurred in the same kind of way in other conferences, just like it did in the Big, the Big Ten. Ten sure. And the NCAA had to go through its, you know, growth stages, because the AIAW was worried that, that um, women's sports would be relegated to, you know, the dustbin, and that they would not be given the support or encouragement and so forth. Well, over time, that has ameliorated, and indeed, uh, the NCAA has plenty of women represented. The women's sports have not destroyed beloved basketball and football, and uh, the Big Ten has even taken in an eleventh. <laughs> and, and become, we move on, we and move. we and we move and we move on. And right. so it was a fascinating period. In, in my life, and I would come home from some of the local um, athletic affairs meetings when we were still seven, and I would say to Al, why am I doing this? You know, I would be so upset by the conversation, 
And I knew that my male colleagues were upset because the hair on the back of their necks was standing up straight just like they were a cat, <laughs> you know, that they were upset. And I said, why am I, you know, why am I fighting these, these battles? They're really, really upsetting me. And, uh, <clears throat> but ultimately, you know, it all worked out in the proper way. But it was, it, it was not, not an easy. easy transition to make. And, and it was hard for, for some of the men um, who, who dearly loved certain aspects of, of the sports arena and feared that they would disappear. And in reality, I think that the sports sphere has expanded and become more inclusive and has done all sorts of positive things for both men and women and beyond basketball and football. Right. And so it has helped many men or boys in high school as just as like it's helped many women in college and girls, you know, who can th then aspire to, to, to this. And right. they learn the same kinds of lessons that boys learned about teamwork and winning and losing and, and, and building long-term relationship. On and right, all of those sorts of things. So, so it was a, you know, it was a worthwhile endeavor, but there were times when, when I, I imagine. wanted to throw the towel in, <laughs> <laughs> literally. Right. Uh, another committee you served on was the uh, University Committee to select the president for Dr. Right, Barry. right. Yeah. Yes, I did, um, and that was a challenging committee because there, each time the president is selected, there there is this tension between the faculty needs and wants and the Board of Trustees needs and wants and the various levels of power that each possess or don't possess. And there always are, you know, horror stories of things which should have, could have, would have, but didn't. Uh, but I have to be, you know, honest in, in saying that, that the experience was a positive one. And I think that each of our presidents, and I've known well each of the presidents from Hanson on. Um, now, Hovde was here when you first came. Yes, right. Hovde was here when I first sure. came, and, but he was not one one got to know very well. <laughs> Well, you're he the, was you're a much more. He was much. Well, he'd been for his here a long time. time. He'd been but, here. I mean, when for you his, came on board, each of our presidents have have been what the university needed for the time, and I I think that that even though there were faculty who were distressed that we we uh, decided on Beering at the time. I think that they would, at the end of his tenure, they would say he he was a good president and he did what the university needed during that time that he was president. And the same thing can be say, said for Jiski, and I hope the same thing can be said right. for for Franz Cordova, right. that they that they each met a need that the university had for the era in which it existed it was, during their tenure. Right, right. and. Um, so, you know, that I mean, all of those committees were interesting for their internal trials and tribulations, and and various kinds of stories, and and you know, some would say that that that, that this was not a good decision that was made, but there is probably no one that you could decide upon that everyone would think was the perfect choice. Right. But in retrospect, I, I think that, that we've all done well. That's right. And uh, I wouldn't want it to change. Now, what, what I did try to do when I was on the Senate, uh, one of, I was on a number of committees, yes, but, one, but one, of them, one of them that I thought was really among, well, there's two that were most important, the educational policy and, and the nominating committee. You wouldn't think that the nominating committee would be a very important committee, but in reality, as chair of the nominating committee, I was able to go out and encourage those women faculty members um, 
who were in positions where they could to uh, put their name forward to be on specific committees. Because in many cases, women did not, they were already busy, they did not put their names forward to be uh, considered for certain committees. And as a result, their voice was not heard. And one of those places was on the University Promotions Committee. That for too long, that committee had either none or very few uh, women faculty members. And one of the reasons was there weren't very many women full professors. And you had to be a full professor in order to be on that committee. That's correct. And so I made a point of, of uh, talking to those women who met that criteria and say, you know, we really need your voice to be on the university faculty committee so that, uh, promotions committee, so that women's voices and their, their ideas of promotion are shared among that committee so that, so that women who come forward um, to the committee, that women who have had unusual experiences as they have moved toward the PhD, you know, weird ones like me, for example, who, who never, I, I didn't start out to, to, sure. to be a, an academic. I didn't even know what it was and sort of got there by a, an unusual route with, with a big blank period of a number of years when I wasn't in school. But we have lots of women who have blanks in their careers for one reason or another, sometimes for, for, for family reasons. And there has to be somebody at the Promotions Committee who understands. Who can address that. And, and be able to speak to those issues. So anyway, that was the, I considered the nominating committee really an important committee in trying to get women on more of the committees for, so their voice could be heard. Mm -hmm. and, and I did work hard at doing that during that period of time. And then That's the Educational point, Policy but... Committee, um, I could either be loved or damned <laughs> because I was the chair of the Educational Policy Committee during a period of time when the calendar of this university was being tinkered with. And it was being tinkered with to shorten it and to make the semester end before the holiday and to end before the end of, um, you know, in early May. And my own personal preference was that I liked the old semesters that began after Labor Day and ended at the end of, end of May or sometimes even the first week of June. That was my preference. I, I liked that. But I thought if there was going to be some serious tinkering that I wanted to be in the middle of it so that the tinkering at least, at least would be tolerable. And the first tinkering that was done uh, ended up where people like my husband, who had 1,500 students, was on Christmas Eve having to do grades because they had, they had compressed things so much. They wanted to start later in uh, August, closer to, to um, uh, Labor Day, but they wanted to end, you know, before Christmas. Well, they, Christmas Eve. <laughs> You know, they ended How close can you get? Yes, and so, so my father-in-law, I mean my father, his father-in-law, and I and Al were going through his cards and we were, we, he was making decisions, you know, and then, uh, and then one of the other of us would be writing them on the grade sheets. And this is how we spent our Christmas Eve. And we said, this is absolutely insanity and to, to finish early. And so the Educational Policy Committee adjusted things so that we never did that again. <laughs> and that was, that was, there was, there was one professor who never did forgive me. <laughs> he said I railroaded that through, which I really didn't. And, but I did have a, have a say in it. <laughs> and so, so that we started a little earlier and we, ended in a sane time <laughs> earlier. Because <laughs> oh. I've always sort of had the philosophy, if you're going to be on a committee, then you, then you better 
do what that committee is supposed to do and if possible have some kind of impact um, As because result. otherwise why, why are you bothering? Right, exactly, that's right. Um, rankings, that's kind of, a, uh, you've seen that, uh, people pay attention and the rankings have changed over time. You mean the, the university yeah, sure. rankings? Well, the U.S. News comes out and there's yes, rankings yes, and yes, the yes. associations or whatever. It's always oh, a it's, challenge. It's a, it, it's a, it's a clique. <laughs> And, it, and if, you have, if you have faculty members and administrators who happen to be in the right cliques and have the right impact, um, you probably can move things up in the rankings. But for universities to do things explicitly to increase their rankings when they don't in their hearts think that this is, this is uh, going to improve the educational quality of the institution, I just don't agree with, with that issue at all. On the other hand, if rankings point out that, that your computer system stinks, you know, and gives you a knock in the head and says, oh, oops, maybe we better do something about this, then they can do some positive things. But uh, there's pluses and minuses. There's pluses too. and minuses. Right. And I think that once you get into the elite groupings at the top, that it's very hard to get knocked out of there, no matter what you do. <laughs> you can stay at that level, right? Yeah, you, you, you stay at that level. And, <laughs> right. and, and Purdue has, has done very well for itself over the years. Right. Um, now, it's true we only have one Nobel Prize winner to our, our name. We should have had two more, um, both in biology, but it didn't happen. And it's probably not going to happen. One of them has passed away now, so I know it won't happen. And the other one is still with us and still doing research, but I still, and he's won everything else, and he has not gotten that one. He's been nominated I don't know how many times. So, so we, we are low in, in, in that regard, but I think in terms of, of our the prestige around the world, you get away from Purdue and you find out how valuable that Purdue degree is. When you're here at home, it's sort of like being in your family. Oh, goodness, you know, you're, you're just same old, same old. But when you get away and people say, oh, you're from Purdue, right. you know. I agree. Uh, and I you travel in, in other parts of the world, and they think that, I mean, Purdue's reputation is, is very, very solid. Very solid. Right, yeah. And uh, you so, had a couple of department heads. You, uh, Henry Coffer was one. Was Lou Sherman was another one. Lou Sherman was another one, yeah. and Struther Arnott was another one. Right. Um, he went on to be the, I think they call it the principal of St. Andrews in, in uh, Scotland. Scotland mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Because he, he was only now he was not here too long, though, was he? Well, he was here. Well, he was here as a professor for a while, and then he was the, oh, the okay. head. And so he was here for right. a reasonable period of time. Uh -huh. And then he went on to be, I, th I think he went on to be in the graduate school and then he went on to, to Scotland. Uh, Scotland, that's mm -hmm. right, yeah. And, and he's now retired. Is he? Then you had the dean, uh, dean of Science, quite a few of those, that Hannah Harry and you worked with Morrison. Right, I Alan worked Clark with, with uh, well, I didn't know, Alan Clark was uh, ahead of me uh -huh. and, and then uh, the infamous Cleaver. Uh, he was, he, he was before Morrison, correct? Yes, he right. was just okay. before Morrison. All right. He was a challenging dean. That's all I'll say about that. Okay. I survived him. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your awards. And I think uh, it's just outstanding. Um, and that Salute to Women Award, the Sagamore, and the Indiana Professor of the Year. How did that How? What was your reaction? How did you find well, out Well, that... that that was pretty fascinating. Um, uh, I was uh, I was absolutely astounded. I mean, when I when I found out that that I was going to be nominated, I said, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> and uh, so I was I was just really honored and and uh, pleased. It's a wonderful opportunity. Wonderful. To um, to have been awarded the Indiana T Professor of the Year. That was right. that was fantastic. You and your husband have established an undergrad teaching award. That's and, right. Uh, that, and uh, that's very nice. Um, well, some of our some of our former colleagues and students uh, have have helped with major uh, donations to that, and we're we're hoping that over that over time that it will have um, a more major impact. 
and whether we'll be around to see it or not, I don't know. But that's a but, very nice thing to but do. But it is yeah. very right. nice, and and it it rewards faculty members uh, who who teach, and uh, which is something we are very dedicated to right. seeing happen. Right. And we hope that the, this will be extended to to. Uh, graduate students who teach and even undergraduates. I mean one of the most interesting teaching components which we were involved with in our teaching career was undergraduates teaching in the laboratories. And you cannot believe how many of our students come back and talk about how important that experience of teaching other yeah. students was and how much they learned that they realized that they didn't have to know just enough to get an A on the test. They had to know enough to, <laughs> to be able to explain to other young uh, biology students and help them to understand a particular concept. And they found that to be one of the critical and interesting and useful experiences of their undergraduate I would career. think so, yes. yes. Right. And, and we had just lots of, we had lots of undergraduates who taught with us over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The pine, women, one of the women that Pioneer Award, that, that's very Yes, nice. I'm still alive. Well, we got that in 206, <laughs> right. And you also got the Violet House Award. Yes. And that's nice because you yes. um, knew. I, I knew Felix. Violet. Right. Um, and you knew Dr. House as well, of course. Right. Who's the yeah. Dean of Science. But um, there was a small group of, of women faculty members that Violet pulled together. And we used to meet informally on a regular basis and try to figure out how to accomplish certain tasks or to help a certain person um, that, uh, or bring about a certain change at the university which would impact uh, women faculty members. And uh, the, the symposium that, that we had before her death was really a very, uh, the highlight, and I'm so happy that it happened before you know, she while was she still, was able sure. to understand what was going on. Right. Yeah. And it was truly sad when she passed. Yes. You've been involved with the President's Council too, haven't you? Yes. Yeah. Yes, for a very long time. Yeah. That's a growing, it keeps growing all the yes, time. Yes, it keeps it? growing. Um, unfortunately, the level at which some people are able to support that is <clears throat> far in excess of what um, faculty members who were teachers. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. okay. able to do, but yes. Okay. Let's talk about your family. Where are the children? Uh, you, had, you said you had two children. Yes, we have two children. They're both adopted. Mm -hmm. um, when after we after we got married, um, there was a period of time when there was a great deal in the news about the children who were left behind in um, in Vietnam and Korea that um, our American soldiers had had uh, produced them and now they were outcasts and we decided that we would begin the process for uh, an international adoption and as we were beginning that process the the um, uh, welfare agent came and asked you know said well we'd like to set up your your home study right away and we wondered hmm wonder why and they had asked us an interesting question. They said, um, since you were interested in international um, adoption, would, are you opposed to biracial adoption? And we said, no. After all, that's what they would be, would be bi yeah. biracial. Uh, and so they set up our home study, and lo and behold, there was this little girl who was sitting and waiting that they wanted to place, that, that um, she had been placed with another family, and it became apparent that she was African American after they placed her, and the family wasn't able to deal with that, and so they gave her back. And oh. so she was sitting in various foster homes, um, waiting for a family. And so at, at nine and a half months, we, we met our daughter, and she had issues of bonding and so forth, as you can imagine, with an early um, situation that she was in. And 
So, and, uh, so she was nine and a half months, and then the following uh, um, year, and that was in May, and then in, in um, uh, October, then there was another child who was in foster home, um, and he was three months, three and a half months old. So we'd never seen the first <laughs> nine months, you know, here we get this three and a half month old little boy. And, uh, um, and he's biracial, actually he's triracial, he's, he has some Cherokee Indian, I mean he has grandparents who was African American and Cherokee, and then his biological mother was Caucasian, so he, he was a, a, a bi or triracial child. And um, so we had these two children that, uh, in fact, I went to class in October and I was to give an exam that day and I said, I'm passing out the exam and I'm going home to have a baby. <laughs> because the welfare folks were supposed to arrive at a certain time. And, and were so both I left these children local where they were here in town? Or, or? Well, um, they actually, they actually were born here in town. We didn't oh, know that okay. at, the, at the time. Well, the reason I ask is you said this one had been moved from a couple of houses and I thought it might be in this area. That's right, what right. Yes, they were both born here in home hospital, I, mm -hmm. I believe, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, which we, we found out later. Because so, I had always thought that they would place people from, you know, sure. outside an area. Right. And, uh, so anyway, we, we had two children and... Um, did, they go uh, to, did they go to Purdue? They, they both went to Purdue. Our son graduated from Purdue. Our, our daughter, mm, she and Purdue parted ways, and um, amicably, sort of. And, but today, she's, she's back and she's going to school part-time and doing very well. Good. So it took her a little longer to appreciate the value of an education. That's okay. <laughs> There are many and they're, that, oh. and they're now both in their their 30s, early uh -huh. 30s. Okay. Do they so live close by, or one of them is in Indianapolis, and one of them, uh, our son is in Chicago, and our daughter is in Indianapolis. Very good. Well, they're and, close by then, right? But um, Al and I married very considerably later than most people um, would have married, and so as our children were growing up, not only were we a strange family in terms of our makeup. You know, we were always telling teachers, I think in your bulletin board of what families look like, there's none that look like our family. Would you like a picture? <laughs> but they're also, but, but also we, we were more the age of the grandparents of their friends rather than the age of their parents. Because <laughs> we okay. were, I mean, Al was almost 40 when... Uh, when Diana came. Oh, so, I have a brother whose child is just 20 and he was quite a bit older when the, that one came along. But so. it's not so uncommon today. No. I mean, people are even having biological children at 50. I know. Mm. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> um, <laughs> now that you've got that Chiskin Award that the Honor Outstanding Teachers in Biological Science, what are some of the other activities you've been involved in since you retired? Well, since I retired, my husband would tell you way too many. Okay. Um, and probably the big ones, um, I'm chair of the benefits committee for the retirees, and so we negotiate the supplemental um, to Medicare uh, supplement each year and try to resolve issues, educate uh, retirees on, on what, our, what our rights are and what our benefits are and so forth. And so I've been very involved in that. And uh, that's a challenge. Yes, it is. Right. Well, it's another situation. I knew that, that Medicare Part D was coming along um, right after I retired, and I said, "Well, I can't complain if I don't have a mouth in it." <laughs> and so, and so I agreed to be on the benefits committee, and and I became the the local guru on Medicare Part D during that period of time, and I gave an all sorts of retiree sem seminars and so forth, trying to educate people on what was coming down the pike. 
and so that they could understand it and, and yes, be able and to I, evaluate it. It's it's still not understandable yeah. by most people. Even if they even if they leave the seminar saying, "I really think I understand it now," you know, in two or three weeks they'll say, mm, "Maybe I don't <laughs> understand that <laughs> I hear, anymore." I hear you. <laughs> and then and then I. Um, uh, Remember, I told you about that sort of quasi sorority that I joined back in in um, some years back. Some years back. <laughs> well, anyway, it it um, sort of merged with another sorority in the '60s, sometime, and I did not choose to become a member of the new sorority at that time, as I thought, you know, why would I need to do that? And it turns out that one of the, that 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 sorority is here locally, and they inducted me in I think it was ninety five or ninety seven as um, a national um, uh, uh, alum member into that sorority, and so of course they felt they could ask me to be on their corporation board. <laughs> <laughs> and I am now I am now the the treasurer of the corporation board, which is a very big job. And so I pay all the bills and and um, you know do the do the taxes and all of that sort of thing. And I've also volunteered at at Civic Theater um, over the over the years. I do their books, and I try and swim. You still in Rotary? You belong to, and know? I belong to Rotary, right. and and I've been I, I've been active in Rotary, you know, up and down and up and down, depending upon how much other things I still have to do. But uh, in fact, I came from Rotary to here, and but I was I was chair of their their information committee, which is the one that that's supposed to educate new members on. What Rotary's all about, and you know all of that. Our activities sort of thing. and things yeah, like so that. I, yeah. We used to have them to our house, and and uh, have a nice little informal gathering. That's nice. Sort what of about uh, how about uh, outstanding event in your life? You got one that you like to share with the researchers? <laughs> well, well, probably I alluded to that earlier. I really think the most important decision that I ever made in my life, looking back. Uh, you know, other other than you know the mentors that I had along the way who were encouraging, like my seventh and eighth grade teacher, Miss Schultz, who was the most wonderful person on planet Earth, and we all loved her to death. And she was the strictest human on planet Earth. <laughs> you know, and she was an old maid. She never married, and she had these these glasses. You know that. Mm -hmm. and she had her little little clock that she looked at it here. <laughs> you know, you you recognize that <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> you know, over time, other but. than other than people like that in my life and Miss Everest in high school and 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 of course Al being the biggest mentor of all. I still think the most important thing that that happened was the decision to come to Purdue on that NSF program. I mean, all else flowed from that. From that. Decision, and I am. I, I've always tried to to uh, instill in my students when I was teaching how important it was to be aware of opportunities that come along that can be life changing. That you may think that you're headed there, and you're looking only this way you may miss something that is the best thing that could ever happen in your life if you aren't more aware and i and i just i don't know where i got that from i know i got my my technological interest from my mother not from my father he he was a artist mu musician artist and a writer but my mother was the one who uh was able to to fix the toaster and and um, uh, put in a new uh, electrical plate for the light switch, and you know I learned those things from her, which is maybe maybe what I inherited, which made me a scientist, always interested in how things function. That curiosity, <laughs> right. yes, that curiosity sort of thing. But um, that decision just led to everything else, and and of course. Um, 
Al sort of being there. I mean, we just we just complement each other very well and always have. In fact, one of my favorite pictures is one that was taken by the I think by the Journal and Courier when they did a piece on us, and we had side by side offices, and we were looking out from each of our offices at each other. That's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> that is a good one. I, that was in the newspaper, and I had yes. that when I was doing yes. research for this. It yes, is good. I, I just love that picture. Just you coming around just right. that. You know, and, and, so many, and so many couples say, well, how could you stand to be around your husband so much? Or how could you stand to be around, around your wife so much? Well, we sort of just grew up together, working together, and it was always a positive thing. I mean, right. um, we we missed not being around each other, and we we sort of learned how to you know live our adult lives, and we 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 each learned that that when one is stressed out about this, that the other one has to be able to do everything so that this one can get done what needs to be done, and vice versa. Right. And so you know, Al's someone who learned how to do laundry. He can shop. He can change diapers. He can. Uh, make formula for babies. Of course, the funniest story. I'm not sure I should tell this story. That's up to you. <laughs> and him. <laughs> that that uh, when we knew that Diana was coming, he he went he went out to the store, and he bought everything that had a baby's picture on it. And one of the things <laughs> that he brought back was nursing bras. <laughs> and I said. Um, I hate to tell you, dear, but I don't think this one's going to be used by us. <laughs> it was he, just, in the he just went down the aisles and he just bought everything that had a baby's picture on it. He figured we must surely need that. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> well, how about some closing and some closing comments for the research or something you'd like to say? Uh, or anything well, I didn't ask that you'd like to share? Well, I'm... I, I think that my my life at Purdue has has really been my life. I mean, I have been here s since the age of 27. Now, obviously, I did a great deal before then, but I'm now 72, and so a great deal of time has passed. And Purdue has has been my family for a very very long time. And it's a comfortable family. Um, it has pushed me to do things that I maybe would not have otherwise done. And it's certainly, we get up every morning and say, thank goodness for Purdue putting that money in Tia Kreff <laughs> so that we could retire. <laughs> because by the, time, by the time the two of us realized that we needed to do something about retirement, it was pretty late, and if Purdue had not been doing that. So anyway, Purdue is sort of like our father and mother and has been very good to us, maybe could have been better in some ways, but nevertheless but was, overall. was overall was pretty good, and, and we both have been very happy here. And we have had thousands of students over the years, and they have been a great joy. Right. And we've met all sorts of wonderful people, which we still know. In fact, at Westminster, there are all sorts of, of Purdue folks that are retired there that, that we know. And so it's, it's just a good community to live in, to raise your children, to work in. And to and, be there. And, and just to be. Right. And um, I, I wouldn't have it any other way. Good. I thank you very much. Well, thank you. I appreciate you. it. My pleasure. Thank you. That concludes the interview. <clears throat>